So um, there was, uh, there also tend to be questions about uh, the lack of a comprehensive exam and what that might mean. I put a little note to uh, make sure that I articulate as well as I can that while there's not a comprehensive exam, uh, we are, this class does build on prior information, right? So the fact that we're testing you on what a kinase is, a kinase is not going to disappear, right? Uh, the things quarter two is going to build on the stuff that you've learned from quarter one, right? But the idea is that we're continually revisiting it in new lights and it helps to helps you to synthesize like what a kinase really does, what the power of it is, how these systems really work by a, a technique we call spiraling. So we'll come back to common themes throughout the course. And at the end, the idea is that those themes you should have a really good grasp of. And that's also why exam scores tend to go uh, up through the term. All right. So I hope everyone uh, has been able to watch the pre-lecture. Uh, this particular series on G protein, uh, G proteins is a little bit different than we've taught it before, and that has to do with some rearrangements of topics. Uh, prior, uh, in prior terms, all the membrane transport, including a lot of calculations of membrane transport, were in this class, and they've now been moved into physiology. There are concepts of membrane transport that we need you to know in order to understand how some of this stuff works. And that's what I did, and I posted, I'm sorry, late last night, the um, membrane transport mini lecture, okay? There are some blue terms on there. There's some basic concepts. I tried to keep it really short and sweet and just tackle the things that we felt like were critical for you guys to understand this lecture and, and certain things moving forward, okay? All right, so for this main lecture, we're going to talk about G proteins, second messengers, and cholera. Uh, and it, it should be, we've got about an hour, and I should be able to fit it in. All right, so cholera. This is an actual flyer uh, that was posted in Dudley, England uh, in the early 1800s, in the early 19th century. Uh, and this is a scenario in the, in the late teen, uh, 1830s where people were dying so frequently from cholera in this town that they had to actually start shifting where they were burying them because they were running out of ground to bury them in. Um, cholera, uh, what they found actually uh, from this particular population, they made many seminal discoveries, including the fact that cholera is a waterborne um, bacteria, right? And so it comes from, it came from a water source uh, and they noticed that people that were living around one of the city wells, they tended to be dying at a much faster rate than other people. And they said, well, let's replace the well. They replaced the well, and the disease pretty much went away. Okay, and so from that, it was uh, one of the more seminal discoveries. So what is cholera? Uh, it's a severe diarrheal disease caused by the bacterium uh, Vibrio cholera. Okay, so I don't have to define what diarrhea is for probably anyone in this room. Uh, I will define severe. Severe is go sit on the toilet and don't move, right? And just keep flushing. It's pretty bad, okay? Uh, and as a consequence, it is that diarrhea and the impacts of that that wind up killing you. All right, the toxin. Uh, there's a toxin that's released by the bacteria and it causes an increase uh, in the secretion of water into your intestines. So if I load my intestines more and more with water, it dilutes um, uh, my, my feces, and, you know, there you go. Wonderful topic, right? All right, All right. and so this is going to cause massive diarrhea. Uh, it is transmitted via contaminated water sources, and again, it was, in fact, this case in 1830 that helped them begin to identify that it's waterborne. Uh, and unfortunately, there are various countries that have tried to weaponize cholera. Uh, it, it kills fast. It, it can kill you within about 6 to 12 hours. Yes. Pretty rough. So what does that progression look like? Uh, as I just mentioned, cholera is one of the most rapidly fatal illnesses known. Uh, initially, a person becomes uh, hypotensive. So you start losing your blood pressure, 
right? So your blood pressure is starting to drop. And this happens within about an hour of the onset of symptoms, i.e. an hour of you start having diarrhea. Uh, you can die within two to three hours of no treatment. Um, yep. All right, more commonly disease progresses um, from the first liquid stool, again diarrhea, to what we call hypovolemic shock. So you start losing your blood volume. You start losing so much blood volume because it's being transferred from your vasculature into your intestines and then you're excreting it out the body so fast that you lose so much volume you can no longer perfuse your entire vasculature. You cannot, there's not enough blood to actually pump. Yes? No, 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 it's a transport of water. You're losing the water out of your blood. So your blood is getting thicker, right? Certainly getting thicker and you're losing volume due to those, due to loss of water. Okay, so that usually, for, for most people, that happens at about 4 to 12 hours. Again, with death following about uh, in about 18 hours, um, up to several days. Severe de dehydration is, in fact, the cause of death. Um, but surprisingly, uh, if you give enough fluids, most people make a full recovery. This is a function of a toxin that gets released. You eventually shed that bacteria that's making the toxin. The toxin goes away and your systems go back to normal. And we'll talk about what the mechanism is uh, of that. Um, so the disease is caused by the cholera toxin. Uh, that would be the ideology. Um, the mechanism is through modification of a G protein. So it is a G protein modifier. Yes. Back then, they didn't know what it was, right? That was number one. Number two, they probably kept giving them, if they were giving them water, they're probably giving them water from a contaminated well, right? Uh, we've had a recent outbreak. Uh, if you guys remember the hurricane in Haiti, uh, there was actually cholera that was brought from one of the volunteers from a foreign country into Haiti, and they're still battling it today. Somebody had a question over here? All right, so you guys have seen this cartoon. Uh, a lot of today is going to be this cartoon over and over and over again with us just adding little bits of um, additional information. All right, so we're going to review G proteins. You guys have seen this in the, in the pre-lecture. Uh, remember that um, this uh, X here is some kind of endocrine factor. Right? that's circulating either in the bloodstream and can be transmitted. It can also be a paracrine factor or cells can activate G protein couple receptors through autocrine mechanisms. Okay? Uh, I think Kevin in the pre-lecture articulated this can be things like smell, uh, like um, chemicals that you smell, that you taste. Right. Uh, so this is a wide range of, these receptors have a wide range of specificities uh, to different molecules and is probably the dominant signaling um, mechanism in, in your body. So this endocrine factor is going to bind your uh, G protein coupled receptors. Remember that's what GPCR stands for. Here's our G protein. When the ligand binds the receptor, what normally happens? What kind of regulation is this? Allosteric, right? So we're getting some allosteric regulation that usually is in the form of a conformational change, right? A shape change. You're going to hear this common theme throughout this entire term. So X binds its G protein couple receptor. It induces a conformational change in the G protein couple receptor, which then transmits that into the G protein. Remember, this is a, a heterotrimer, if I can get my mouse back, of an alpha, a beta, and a gamma subunit. The alpha subunit is tethered to the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane through a modification, and the gamma chain is as well. I think it was highlighted in the pre-lecture that the beta and gamma chain form what's called a constitutive, um, or constitutive binders. Constitutive meaning chronic or sustained, right? And so 
very little disturbs that interaction. So while the beta chain is not physically tethered to the membrane, it effectively is through its association with the gamma chain, okay? So we get a conformational change transmitted from the receptor into the G protein. What that's gonna do is uh, allow the exchange, remember um, the uh, alpha subunit, G alpha, is a GTPase, so it's gonna bind guanine triphosphate. And remember that it, it's, uh, it's gonna go from a GDP bound state into a GTP bound state. And I'll reiterate something that I talked about with tubulin, which is that it's not a phosphorylation event. You don't add a phosphate to GDP uh, through a kinase. It is an actual exchange. So the GDP has to completely come off, and a new charged GTP will come and bind. Okay? When that GTP, uh, when the alpha subunit binds the uh, GTP, uh, it activates it and allows dissociation of that alpha subunit from the G protein. It can then diffuse laterally within the plasma membrane. It's tethered to the membrane. Remember, one of the things we talked about early in quarter one is that by tethering things to the membrane, we limit the degrees of freedom, the degree of freedom of diffusion. So it can only diffuse in the plane of the membrane, okay? Your enzyme adenylene cyclase, which was again sort of I think introduced in the, in the pre-lecture, is also tethered to the plasma membrane. And so these two proteins can diffuse around, right? So they're not, the cartoon shows it like a beeline, like the alpha subunit is seeking, right, the adenylene cyclase. That's not correct. But they do find each other very, very quickly because we've reduced that third dimension of diffusion. The association of the alpha subunit with adenylene cyclase results in the activation of that enzyme. Does anybody remember what adenylate cyclase does? Yeah. Yeah, cyclic AMP. Yeah, yeah, cyclic AMP. So it's going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP. All right, cyclic, yeah, cyclic AMP. Um, and so that enzyme, again, and remember the point of secondary messengers, we talked, uh, Kevin talked a little bit about amplification. That's a big uh, proponent uh, or a big uh, pr uh, part of the process of uh, second messengers is that you get an enzyme that can convert many, one signal, right? One association with this alpha subunit of G protein into many, many uh, secondary messengers, okay? So it's going to cleave off two of those phosphate groups, and it's going to cyclize that last phosphate group into cyclic AMP. All right, so the alpha subunit is a GTPase. So like tubulin, if you remember the GTP cap, right, there's a certain residency time, a certain amount of time that the, the GTPase activity of that protein is required in order to convert it from GTP into GDP, right? And so that residence time is in play right here. As long as this alpha subunit has not hydrolyzed, right, that GTP into GDP plus inorganic phosphate, it's in its active form and it's activating adenylate cyclase. The minute that enzymatic activity, that GDPase activity, converts that ATP, it loses its activity, it, oh, I'm going the wrong way, it dissociates, uh, and we stop the activity of adenylate cyclase. So that's a timed function of the enzymatic activity of, of the alpha subunit. So now we have all this cyclic AMP. We're going to talk about what it's going to do here in a few slides. But it's a prominent signaling molecule in the cell, and so we've got to start getting rid of it, right? Or else whatever it's signaling will continue to signal, continue to signal, continue to signal. So, yeah. its own GDPase activity, right? So alpha subunit's ability to convert its, the GTP that's bound to it into GDP, that is what inactivates that subunit, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's gonna help couple it to specific uh, G-protein coupled receptors, right? 
and it's a part of the machinery, right, in order to transmit this conformational change from the receptor into the alpha chain. Mm -hmm. No, it's fine. TP to GDP. A GTP ACE is going to hydrolyze GTP into GDP. Right? We're hydrolyzing one of those phosphates off. Okay. All right. So we have another class of enzymes in our body known as phosphodiesterases. Uh, and what these are going to do, um, and again, a lot of this is review from uh, the pre-lecture, is it's going to clip, it's going to cleave that, it's going to remove the cycle, the cyclic structure of cyclic AMP, right? So it cleaves that one bond and allows that phosphate. Now it's going to go from cyclic AMP to AMP. And now it can be converted into ADP and then subsequently ATP through mechanisms that we're going to talk about much later. Yeah. H2O, so any, uh, any hydrolase, right? So an ATP ACE is a hydrolase. It's hydrolyzing ATP or, uh, well, I just, did I just say ATP ACE or GTP ACE? Sorry. So this is a GTP ACE. A GTP ACE is a GTP hydrolase, right? Uh, and so what it's going to do is it's going to use water to hydrolyze that phosphate group, the, the diester bond that's uh, that's of that terminal phosphate, inorganic phosphate group. It's going to hydrolyze that bond and release that inorganic phosphate. Okay? It's using water to do that. Yeah. Uh, a phosphatase is a little bit different because it's removing a phosphate group um, from a tyrosine, a serine, or a threonine. Here, we're actually cleaving a triphosphate group, so it's a different different class of enzyme. That's a good question. Any others? Okay. Yeah. The, the, the GTPase is only going to cleave the terminal, that, tri, that third phosphate group off. Okay. All right. So what they really look like, instead of these um, triangles and Pac-Man-like structures, this is what uh, the G protein actually looks like with the alpha chain in red, the beta chain in green, and the gamma chain in blue. We can spin it around, and you can see maybe in there, uh, in this little pocket in the alpha subunit, uh, that's GTP. Um, it's, uh, I guess I will note here, uh, without uh, making it too confusing, that uh, normally uh, it's very difficult to capture, you would think it would be difficult to capture that alpha subunit in the GTP bound state, right? Because when GTP binds, alpha subunit dissociates from the beta and gamma subunits. But here, for whatever reason, under unknown reasons, when they tried to crystallize it, they can only get crystal structures when it's in the GTP bound state. So it's just an anecdote uh, of this field. It really confuses a lot of people in this field, and I'm sure someone's trying to figure out the answer. Okay, so what does a GPCR G protein complex really look like? Here's an example of one. This is the beta adrenergic receptor here in gold, and here's the G protein here. Again, alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. Just in case you're wondering, it took this poor fella at Stanford 10 years to get this structure. 10 years. But the 10 years was paid off because he won the Nobel Prize. This structure won the Nobel Prize. I'm not, I'm not that patient. All right. Um, another little anecdote, if I can pause it here. If you guys see uh, this structure here uh, in green, uh, this is a really, uh, we ta we've talked a little bit about common structures. Uh, I made a mention in when we were talking about muscles about the, the protein Titan. Uh, Titan actually has these tandem repeats of what we call type three repeats. Uh, 
And these repeats, as you're reading the literature, these repeats get their name because they keep showing up in multiple proteins. Right? They tend to come from very similar types of primary structures that form very similar types of secondary structures. Uh, and they can have then, therefore, some level of conserved function. Not always, but, but sometimes. In this case, this is a structure known as the beta propeller. I bring it up because I'm an integrin guy, uh, and beta propeller is a big part of how integrins bind the extracellular matrix as well. So, All right. So let's talk a little bit about now how, uh, where cyclic AMP goes. Um, and, uh, and we're going to address, I guess, or introduce this protein known as protein kinase A. So cyclic AMP, we talked about how it's generated by adenylate cyclase. Uh, it turns on what's known as cyclic AMP activated protein kinase, or PKA, or protein kinase A. You might see it um, written in any of those formats. PKA, protein kinase A, or the long, long-winded one, cyclic AMP activated protein kinase. All right. What PKA is, is, uh, is a um, macromolecular complex. It's comprised of two catalytic subunits and two regulatory subunits. All right, flashback. What's the difference between a subunit and a domain? No, it's okay. Different proteins that combine into a, ter uh, into a quaternary structure, right? A domain is what? Do you want to try to answer that? Correct, right? So a domain is within one protein, right? Structurally distinct regions within a single protein. Subunits implies that it's separate proteins. In this case, these are two different genes. A gene for the catalytic subunit, a gene for the regulatory subunit. They make different proteins. They come together in a, uh, into a complex. All right. So the two catalytic subunits are, uh, Kinases, right? So we talked a lot about kinases. These are things that are going to modify serines, threonines, um, and tyrosines with a phosphate group. Right? Uh, and so it has two of those, and it has two regulatory subunits. And these are effectively cyclic AMP sensors. Right? So cyclic AMP is going to bind one of the regulatory subunits, or going to actually bind both regulatory subunits, it's going to induce a conformational change, a dissociation of the regulatory unit from those catalytic domains. Talked a little bit about that in when we were discussing myosin, sort of a common, common theme of a regulatory unit hiding uh, part of the protein that is enzymatic. Uh, that's the same case here. Interestingly, we've also talked about things like cooperativity, right? So in this case, uh, PKA, when it binds cyclic AMP, those two cyclic AMP sites display cooperativity, such as such that the first one that binds is much harder to bind, but once it binds, it facilitates the binding of the second cyclic AMP. Okay? All right. There are the catalytic domains. There are the regulatory domains. And again... Uh, the binding of cyclic AMP dissociates the regulatory subunits from the catalytic subunits, and now you have an active enzyme. The enzyme is a kinase. What does a kinase do? Good. <laughs> All right. So PKA uh, can phosphorylate a ton of stuff. We're not going to talk about them. PKA is a central protein. It has a ton of substrates. We could spend probably the entire rest of the term talking about all the different signal transduction pathways that PKA can, can drive. There are things like cell survival, cell migration, cell proliferation, cell differentiation. Pretty much everything that the cell does, uh, PKA has an impact on, on that. Okay. All right. So it's not always about cyclic AMP. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there are two, so a single PKA has two regulatory subunits. 
So it requires two cyclic AMPs for that one enzyme to become activated. Okay. Yeah. I thought you were going to ask how one signaling molecule can drive so many diverse functions. We're not going to get into that so much in this class, uh, but interestingly, in signal transduction, we have things called divergent signals and convergent signals. So PKA, because it has a number of substrates, it can, bi it can bind and, and modify A, B, C, and D. But you have other proteins, other kinases and phosphatases that are having their own activities as well. And some of these can actually then cause these, these signals that have, that have quote unquote diverged, right, have multiplied across species, then they can actually display convergence as well. And a lot of times downstream we have, and we're going to get to an example of it, coincidence detectors, right? So A has to be phosphorylated and Z1 has to be dephosphorylated. And only under those conditions does that protein display an activity. So there's a lot of signaling networks, a lot of logic gates if you're into computer science. The cell has a ton of logic gates within it in order to help determine how these signals get propagated into cell behaviors, okay? Including things like gene transcription stuff. Okay, so we're gonna consider now in trying to get away from you thinking that cyclic AMP is the only secondary messenger, we're gonna talk about a couple others. And we're gonna do this in the context of smooth muscle cells um, and smooth muscle cell contraction. So hopefully it's a little bit uh, common to you. Um, we're going to look at smooth muscles, the ones that are lined. These are the cells that are lining the arteries and are going to contract and relax, right? If you're stressed out, right, then you have vasoconstrictors that start to tighten up your vessels and your blood pressure goes up, right? And then the doctor will give you a vasodilator to try to relax your blood system, right? So we're going to talk about the second messengers associated with that process. Okay. So... Just remembering that in increased intracellular calcium, again, one of the probably the primary second, second messenger in our bodies, uh, it is this intracellular calcium influx uh, that causes muscle contraction. Remember through calcium-dependent myosin-like chain kinases that we talked about in the activation of, of myosin. Okay, so let's just state that as a fact. All right. So one way, uh, we're going to talk about these two uh, second messengers, uh, and it's derived from, I don't know if you guys can hearken all the way back to when I talked about phospholipid, phospholipid bilayers, and we started talking about the fatty acids. One I pointed out was phosphoinositol, and I said, this one's a really cool one, because it does a lot of things and it's a lot, has a lot of diversity. So this guy, here he comes, he's back again, that is ph uh, phospholinositol or phosphoinositol. This one happens to be phosphoinositol, that's where the PI comes from, 4,5-bisphosphate. The 4 and the 5, so bisphosphate has two extra phosphate groups. The 4 and the 5 tell us what the positions, which carbon it's on. So this is the one carbon where it associates, right, with the glycerol and the fatty acids. We count down, 2, 3, 4. Here's the fourth uh, carbon, there's a phosphate, and the fifth carbon, there's a phosphate. So that's how it gets its name. Thankfully, biologists don't like to talk in chemical terms, so we call it PIP2. Okay, that's its. Uh, that's usually what we call it in biology. So PIP2 is going to be impacted by this enzyme uh, called phospholipase C or PLC. Anyone want to fathom a guess about what a phospholipase does? Even though it actually kind of shows the reaction. Yeah, it's going to cleave phospholipids, okay? In this case, it's going to cleave the phosphodiester bond that associates the inositol unit from the, the diacylglycerol, all right? This glycerol molecule. So diacyl, two acyl fatty acid acyl chains, and glycerol, diacylglycerol. So it's going to generate two pro... Yes. It is, a phos it is a phosphodiesterase. It's a specific one called phospholipase because it's going to target these phospholipases specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll find a lot of enzymes do very similar. So it's like, think about it like a kinase, 
we have, I don't know how many kinases in our body. We have many, many, how many? How many? 500 kinases, right? They're all catalyzing one reaction, the addition of phosphate, right, to a serine, a threonine, or a uh, tyrosine. Um, but they all have relative specificity for their substrate. So it's the same thing. This is a phosphodiesterase, but it is called phospholipase because it's specific for this type of species, okay? So it's going to generate a diacylglycerol and this molecule, uh, which is uh, inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate, tri right? So three phosphate groups in the 1, 4, and 5 position around an inositol ring. Thankfully, we call this IP3, okay? All right, so these are your second messengers, diacylglycerol or DAG and IP3. So let's talk about a system where we're going to engage that. So we're going to talk about the angiotensin and angiotensin uh, 2 receptor. Angiotensin, as the name implies, is a, is a hormone that gets secreted. It binds a receptor, and it causes your blood pressure to go up. Right? It causes smooth muscle cells to contract, constrict on your vessels, and raise your blood pressure. Okay? Angiotensin 2. All right, so it's angiotensin 2 uh, binds to a G protein couple receptor. This is all gonna look very familiar, undergoes, um, induces allosteric regulation, and allosteric conformational change uh, with the G protein couple receptor that gets transmitted to that beta gamma subunit of G protein, which enables, now we haven't colored it green, right? Enables GTP to bind the alpha subunit to become active and dissociate from the beta and the gamma subunit. In this case, this alpha subunit is going to associate with phospholipase C. Yes? Angiotensin 2. For short, we call it ANG2. Okay. Now, in this case, phospholipase C, just in case you're wondering, uh, the cartoons are accurate. It is not chemically modified such that it has a tether directly into the plasma membrane. These are ionic interactions that keep it associated, right? So we talked about the different kinds of proteins and associated with the membrane, and one were membrane-associated proteins, right? Not the ones that go through, the, not the ones that intercalate into the membrane, but the ones that are electrostatically associated with that uh, phospholipid bilayer. So PLC is one of those proteins, okay? So alpha, the alpha subunit of the G protein can associate with PLC, it activates it. PLC, again, is going to now catalyze that reaction uh, with PIP2 and generate diacylglycerol and IP3. We'll let PLC go on, and it's going to catalyze multiple reactions. Right? More DAG, more IP3. So how does this have to do with smooth muscle cell contraction? Well, we talked about calcium influx, right? into the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell as an activator of cell contractility. And I believe we also uh, highlighted for you guys that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is one of the places inside our cell that we store high levels of calcium. In fact, one millimolar. Right? So again, the mini lecture, I asked you to get familiar with the, the range of of concentrations of potassium, sodium, and calcium in different compartments, right? Inside the cell, we're talking about 0 0.0001 millimolar of calcium. In the extracellular space and in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it's around one millimolar, so much higher concentration. So those are like floodgates. If we can open up the floodgates, we can get, a, we can get the cytoplasm to flood with calcium, you get that rise, that spike in, um, in calcium influx, and then you get activation of, of contractile machinery. So there is this receptor on the smooth endoplasmic reticulum called IP3 receptor that binds IP3, and it is a channel. So it's going to bind, cause a conformational change, and open up that channel and allow calcium to flood out of the ER, smooth ER, 
and into the cytoplasm and began to activate calcium-dependent myosin activation. Okay? All right, so calcium efflux leads to this short-term contractility. Of course, it'd be really bad if our systems contracted and then couldn't relax again. So we have to have these regulatory mechanisms where you have a signal that pulses, but the signal has to go away. Okay, and we're going to keep highlighting these kinds of negative in inhibitory uh, regulatory mechanisms as a way to get all of our systems, after they're stimulated, they have to come back to their baseline. Right? So in this case, uh, we have another enzyme known as PKC or protein kinase C. Right? And this is what I was talking about before. It is a coincidence detector. It requires both the binding of diacylglycerol that was produced and where the C comes from is it has to bind calcium ions in order to become active. Both of these things have to occur for PKC to be active. So while PKC is soluble in the plasma membrane, all its activity is at the membrane because it has to be bound to that diacylglycerol in order to be active. Okay. And the activation of PKC leads to long-term uh, uh, an inhibition, right? So I should denote that arrows, when we denote things with arrowheads, it means usually an activation step. If we have this blunted in, almost like a T here, in signal transduction, we're implying that it's an inhibitory activity, right? So PKC, the way you'd read this pictorially is PKC activation leads to inhibition of long-term uh, contractility. How does it do it? It's, a, it's way more complicated than the efflux of, of calcium. Uh, because it's at the membrane, it's going to phosphorylate a number of channels and pumps that all influence ion flux across the membrane that ultimately lead to um, the, the, uh, the inhibition of cellular contractility. It also indirectly uh, will desensitize this receptor, the angiotensin II receptor for angiotensin II. So it kind of deadens the receptor and quiesces, silences the contractility through, again, it's not necessary that you know, know the mechanism, it's pretty complicated. Okay, so here we have a system where we have three different second messengers, diacylglycerol, PIP3, and calcium. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yep, yep. It stays there and it's going to activate, well, things like PKC, but it has other, other enzymes that it will also activate. Okay. What's that? Well, it's moving only in the plane of the membrane, right? And so this is another scenario. We talked about compartmentalization earlier in the term. This is a great example of compartmentalization. I have a receptor that's sitting here on the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the fact that I have IP3 associated with this diacylglycerol in phosphoinositol, right, as PIP2, we're, we're, we're segregating that signaling molecule from its receptor. So we can trigger that, it can diffuse, and now it can bind, right? Does that make sense? And so now diacylglycerol, we also talked about restricting 2D diffusion. Diacylglycerol now is going to activate any membrane associated uh, or a class of membrane associated proteins. All right. So let's just run through the pathway really quickly um, in written form. So the GPCR, the G protein couple receptor, activates a heterotrimeric G protein, which activates phospholipase C. Phospholipase C is going to uh, cleave the, the phosphoinositide called PIP2 to yield this diacylglycerol and IP3, both secondary messengers. IP3 is now going to bind the IP3, IP3 receptor on the smooth uh, ER and release all that calcium into the cytoplasm. 
going to activate cell contractility. And then calcium and diacylglycerol together activate conventional uh, PKCs, protein kinase C, at the plasma membrane. Eventually, this is going to lead to the activation of pumps that, that get calcium back out of the cytoplasm and into the smooth ER. Okay? There will be pumps that become activated. And we talked about that in the membrane transport mini lecture. These things called pumps that require ATP and ATP hydrolysis to generate energy to move things against, right, against their electrochemical gradient. Okay. All right. Eventually, diacylglycerol is going to be phosphorylated by uh, a kinase called DAG kinase. And now we get back to, we get uh, to this phospholipid precursor. So you're asking sort of what happens to it. You've destroyed what is part of the plasma membrane, right? Or at least one of the lipid moieties in there. Uh, uh, it can be phosphorylated. And now that's a substrate. It's a precursor for forming uh, another phospholipid. Okay. Um, I guess I was going to mention that if you're wondering what IP3 happens to the IP3, uh, it actually, there's a series of phosphatases. I kind of made a joke with you guys earlier about kinases that they're kinases of kinases and they get, so IP3 synthesis, our, our digestion is the same way. There's an IP3 phosphatase that removes a phosphate group. Uh, then there's an IP2 phosphatase that removes <laughs> that other one, right? And so you get now all these inorganic phosphates that can be recycled, right, and used in the synthesis of things like ATP and GTP. Okay? So we're pretty good in our bodies about recycling stuff. All right. Um, so let's talk, going too fast on my slides here. Um, let's talk then about another uh, scenario. In this case, so we talked about contractility of smooth muscle cells. Let's talk about relaxation of smooth muscle cells. Uh, so again, another scenario using three different secondary messengers. Okay, Let's say you receive signals that open up calcium channels on your extracellular, on your plasma membrane. So now we're letting extracellular calcium into the smooth muscle cell. We're raising, right, we're raising that intracellular calcium concentration. We're getting cell contractility. You might want to relax, right? So one of the things that helps your vessels chill out is a molecule, known, another secondary messenger, known as nitric oxide. Nitric oxide tends to be made by endothelial cells, right, to help communicate to your smooth muscle cells to please relax, chill out. It's made by an enzyme known as nitric oxide synthase. That's not critical. But again, I want to, I want to make sure that you guys are going back and looking at the, the membrane transport mini lecture because one of the concepts in there is that gases are permeable to the plasma membrane, to lipid bilayers specifically. Okay. So nitric oxide is a second messenger that's a gas. Right. And so it can go right across the plasma membrane, uh, and it's going to bind um, this uh, guanyl cyclase. So just like an um, adenine, uh, adenosine cyclase, there's a guanoside cyclase that's going to convert GTP into cyclic GMP. Same, same basic principle. Okay. Here's your second secondary messenger of two. Okay. Protein kinase G, you can see where this is going, right? Protein kinase G that binds cyclic GMP, that's where the G comes from. And now you get an active kinase here, uh, active PKG. How does active PKG then help us to stop contracting? It's going to phosphorylate a number of species. One of those is our calcium ion channels. So it's going to phosphorylate and turn those off. So now we stop the influx of calcium into the cell. And the other thing it will do is it'll phosphorylate uh, calcium pumps in the smooth ER. So now we're going to start act. We're going to activate pumps that then use energy from ATP hydro uh, um, hydrolysis 
in order to drive calcium against its electrochemical gradient into, uh, into this uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Again, maintaining, getting back to steady state, which is one millimolar concentrations. Yeah. The channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to be careful. Phosphorylation events, we, you tend to hear them described as activating steps. They aren't. They are a chemical modification that changes the activity of its substrate, right? Of the product. And so if, right, so in this case, we're changing a calcium channel from active to inactive. And in another case, a phosphorylation event is leading to the activation, right, of something. So be, be real careful about trying to, about assuming that phosphorylation is always an activating step. That's not always the case. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, because you, the requirement is that they're hydrolyzing they're hydrolyzing, in that case, ATP, and it's the hydrolysis, the energy from that hydrolysis that allows them to put the phosphate group on. So they'll, they'll use additional, in that case, ATP molecules to help facilitate phosphorylation. Okay. So this is how, so we've got one example of secondary messengers activating smooth muscle cells and another one in relaxing. And I think we'll still make it through our lecture. Are there any, um, just looking at this, in case anyone was knowing, I have a note that nitric oxide is synthesized from arginines. So nitric oxide synthase takes arginines, undergoes a chemical, enzymatic chemical reaction that converts them into, um, or sheds off a of nitric oxide. They are free radicals. So what happens to, we've talked a lot about what happens to second messengers, right? So again, there is, uh, in this case, uh, phosphodiesterase uh, number five that will actually break that cyclic GMP, right? So that we destroy one secondary messenger. Um, the nitric oxide, the calcium is being dealt with, right? There's our other secondary messenger. The nitric oxide is a free radical, right? And anyone who's had chemistry knows that free radicals are highly reactive. And what they're going to wind up doing is they're very short-lived. So they're going to wind up um, nitrosylating other proteins. Okay? That can actually be really bad, right? So if you get, and we'll talk, I think uh, Kevin will give a lecture on oxidative stress and oxidative signaling later. When you get high levels of oxidative stress, high levels of free radicals, right? They bind up, they can modify your proteins and change their, their activity in ways that we don't want. So we look at that in the extracellular matrix, that nitrosylation of matrix proteins changes their conformation, now no longer, they can no longer bind integrin and signal like they normally would. Yeah. You are chemically modifying the protein with that nitric oxide, so you have an NO structure on there. Um, and I think it's primarily, again, modifying arginine, is that right? What is the nitrosylation? I know oxidation are usually sulfhydryl groups, so free cysteines get oxidized. Um, I think lysines can be nitrosylated. Don't hold me to that. I can, yeah, I can look that up. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is not a GP, uh, a GPCR activated G protein. Okay. All right, so let's just review real quick. We've got about 10 minutes and I want to get back to cholera. So nitric oxide, again, synthesized usually by endothelial cells. That's where we usually find it made. Uh, in this guanyl cyclase pathway. So Na diffuses, can diffuse right across the membrane. It gets to its target, which is the guanyl, guanylyl cyclase. Uh, it's an agonist. So we talked about, uh, we, I don't think we've talked about agonist versus antagonist. Agonist is uh, an activator. 
antagonist would be an inhibitor. Okay? You see these terms kind of thrown around. So cyclic GMP is generated um, by this enzyme, guanyl uh, cyclase. Cyclic GMP activates protein kinase G. Protein kinase G is going to phosphorylate substrates, of course, right? It's all these substrates, right? Including proteins that control intracellular calcium concentrations. There's channels that are allowing influx into the cytoplasm and the pumps that are pumping it out. Okay. All right. Again, cyclic GMP, I just mentioned this, is converted into GMP, a precursor for forming GDP and then GTP. So we have enzymes that, that get us back to a GTP state. Uh, but cyclic GMP is converted to GMP by phosphodiesterase 5. Okay. So what the heck does this have to do with cholera? All right. So let's try to synthesize some of these concepts into a system in your gut, okay? So what we're looking at here is uh, an intestinal epithelial cell, right? So you can think about the intestinal lumen over here, the blue side, that's the interior of your intestine. That's where all the food and nutrients are going that you're ingesting. Okay? On the left is your basal or the body side, right? Uh, we talked about in the membrane transport, very briefly touched on the concept of tight junctions, right, that help establish the top, the apical surface, from the bottom, the basal surface of the cell. Okay. So your intestinal epithelium, or they're also called enterocytes, have tight junctions that are establishing the top from the bottom. And these are also regulating where your receptors uh, can move from, okay? So um, we've talked about G protein coupled receptors, and we'll get to that. This is the adenylyl cyclase, right? Here's PKA, so we've, we're familiar with these. And I'm going to introduce this thing called CFTR. CFTR is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance receptor. When you hear about people that have CF or cystic fibrosis, this is the chloride channel. It's a chloride channel. This is what is messed up. I think it's something like 85% of patients with CF have a single point mutation, F508, phenylalanine in the 508 position. And that effectively eliminates the ability of this uh, uh, ABC transporter, right? So I mentioned different types of transporters. That was not in one that you had to memorize, but in pumps, this is an ATP pump, right? It's what we call an ABC transporter. Uh, and it's going to transport chloride ions. And this receptor here helps establish the fluid flux across a cell membrane. Right? Okay. So in this case, uh, it happens in the lung. We mostly hear about problems with CF patients with their lung. They have really thick mucus because they can't transport liquids from their body into the airway into their airway spaces to thin out the mucus. Interestingly, these patients also have uh, digestive issues, right? So actually, one of my best friends in graduate school worked on uh, some really cool bioengineering to kind of help people absorb so they have problems absorbing nutrients. Right? And a lot of it has to do with this fluid flux issues. Okay, so the system is that we have this thing called the vasoactive um, intestinal peptide, or VIP. It's a hormone. It'll bind a G protein couple receptor. I'll fly through this, right? It causes a conformational change. It activates the G alpha subunit, which goes on to activate adenylyl cyclase, generate cyclic AMP, right? We know these players. It binds PKA. Now you get an activated PKA. And what protein kinase A is going to do is it's going to phosphorylate uh, and open that CFTR. So now I can start getting chloride ions coming out of the cell and into the intestinal lumen. And as a consequence, the counter ion sodium, right? We're making salt. So we're making salty, the interior of our lumen salty. And when we have a high salt concentration, what does that generate? Anybody? Osmosis, right? An osmotic, a strong osmotic pressure. So we start inducing osmosis, uh, generating a, a large osmotic pressure. 
And now we start getting water transported from the body into the lumen. Okay. So what is cholera toxin doing? Cholera toxin is an ADP ribosylation, uh, ribosylate. It's going to ribosylate the uh, gamma alpha subunit, or excuse me, the G alpha subunit of G protein. And effectively what it's going to do is it, it kills the GTPase activity of the alpha subunit. So remember, there's a timing unit. Tick tock, right? I become activated because I bound GTP and time is passing and my enzyme activity kicks in at X amount of time and I convert that from an ATP, excuse me, yeah, uh, an, a GTP into a GDP and I become inactive. What this toxin does is it eliminates that activity. So once I'm bound GTP, I'm forever on. I can't shut off. So what that's gonna do in our system here, everything's the same. We get activation of GPCR, we get activation of the alpha subunit, but that toxin is going to undergo, it's going to facilitate this ADP ribosylation, which is going to prevent this alpha subunit from ever hydrolyzing that GTP into GDP. So it cannot turn itself off. So it's on, it's on, it's on. CFTR is open, chloride ions are coming out of your cell, right, and out of your body into your lumen. Water's coming with it, and it, it can't turn off. There's a really simple, we talked about it, really simple solution to this, which is hydration, right? What I'm doing is I'm expelling all my water. This toxin makes me expel every bit of my water out of my body, right? And so if we can hydrate people with IVs, right? The people that die usually die before they can get to the hospital, right? Um, the World Health Organization uh, has a quick fix. You can actually mix half a teaspoon of table salt, eight teaspoons of sugar in one quart of water. One, eight, one. Uh, and this actually, um, the glucose is, um, is um, basically a, a simple sugar, a disaccharide. Uh, and so the sodium is gonna drive the uptake of glucose. So the reason you add glucose is it actually really helps um, stabilize osmosis. It's trapped in the cell, right? And by osmosis helps to retain the water. Uh, or you can go drink some Gatorade. But I'm guessing in like rural Haiti after a hurricane, there's probably no Gatorade around. But. All right, so if you like cholera, <laughs> go see this guy. He's actually, uh, he's like one of the world's experts in, um, in um, infectious disease, excuse me. And then if you like secondary messengers, um, Jeff Saucerman in our own department is really interested in cyclic AMP signaling in the heart. Uh, and Craig, Craig Nunemaker uh, is interested in calcium signaling and diabetes. All right, guys, there is a quiz on Thursday. It'll cover the mini lecture, the pre-lecture, and this lecture, which are kind of one little